All right. Um, hello, everyone. So uh, we're going to have an exciting 20 minutes with a quick tour through uh, LPWAN and cellular IoT. So we'll see how, how good this happens over 20 minutes. Um, so who am I? Um, so my name is Brian Hughes, and I'm CTO of a company here in the Bay Area called Space Time Insight. So we are in the industrial automation and utilities sector. So our customers include uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, Florida Power and Light, Georgia Power. We are also in transportation with Union Pacific and uh, logistics with FedEx. So, um, so our, our, what we offer from a company standpoint is that we have a IoT ingestion and bi-directional communication platform entirely written in Erlang. Um, we support a variety of protocols, Modbus, CoAP, uh, MQTT. Um, and then we also offer predictive analytics. So we have anomaly detection, failure detection, um, and then we have a visualization component. So, so that's a little bit about who I am. So I've been coding in Erlang for about eight years now. So I remember the day not too long ago when there weren't line numbers in the stack trace. So that, that was fun. Um, so you've heard this before, like what's up with IoT? You know, I, I'm, I'm actually quite sick and tired of this term, most people are. Um, and the interesting thing from an industrial perspective is that it's actually been around forever, right? Like there's, it's, it's got this new hype around it, but M2M has been around for a very long time. So uh, it's, it's only today what's happened is there's been a convergence between low cost sensors low cost bandwidth and big data. And now suddenly I can put a sensor on anything and everything. You know, we have the, 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 your platform, the GRIS platform, which is really, you know, getting into the marketplace, right? So, so the hype, you know, 2025, 75 billion things are connecting, but it's actually the reality. <laughs> so this is the challenge is IoT is this kind of place where there's a lot of the graveyard is becoming full of a lot of startups and companies that have been trying to tackle it, but haven't been able to weather through the desert, right? It's a long desert, and that's because industrial and enterprises are slow to move. And they're so slow, you just run out of money, right? So, so far, the Internet of Things has been about connecting wired things and fixed things, and some wireless, right, Zigbee. Z-Wave. Home automation is kind of the forefront of kind of the latest technologies in, in wireless. Um, MQTT is an awesome protocol, but for example, industrial control systems don't produce MQTT, they produce Modbus. And then getting that transformed and out using MQTT is not a trivial task. So, so in the future, the internet, so this is where we come into play uh, space time, is that you have a lot of wired manufacturing facilities, wired things that, you know, um, but the future is actually, now that I can put low cost sensors on things, I can start instrumenting my wind farm. I can start instrumenting my solar farm. I can start instrumenting uh, weather collectors out in the field, right? So more and more of these devices are, are becoming more and more widespread in, in remote regions, and I don't have infrastructure. Right? So, so, so I need to deal with how do I get my sensors deployed out into the wild? What happens if they're moving in low power? Right? So interestingly enough, this future is actually here. So there's lots of companies that are trying to make headway into this. And ironically, it's the same companies that have been putting up the barriers. So for example, one of our customers, um, they just dropped $15 million to instrument their power poles. Right, so this is an interesting problem. They have 1.8 million poles that cover their, 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 their customer's territory. And the problem is, is that cars drive into them, power poles snap, they lean, storms come through and, and weaken the pole, and these poles have a 20-year life. Right, this is, they're supposed to be around for 20 years. And so what happens is that when a subsequent storm comes through, suddenly three million people are without power. Right, so suddenly it went from being a risk to an issue, right? And they say, all right, cool, here's $15 million, go solve the problem, right? And so in this case, they're putting these little sensors on each pole, right? And they're using LoRa, which is an interesting solution. 
And they have an accelerometer, and they need to then create a mesh and then get the information up to the cloud. Same goes true with wind farms, right? So wind farms are an interesting beast because even though you'd say, oh, well, they're producing power. Well, there's a thing called broad, uh, broadband over power lines, which is this kind of misconception that this is a solution for transmitting data over power lines. The problem is, is that over power lines, it attenuates the signal, and it pretty much makes like ham radios impossible or anything else. So the interference is just ridiculous, right? So the problem is, is I have a wind farm, 100, 100 turbines out in the middle of the Palm Spring Desert. I, have a, I want to predict when they fail. Right? So I have a crankcase. That's the first place that you use your predictive analytics anomaly detection to determine whether or not the gearbox is going to fail. Then I can information coming off of the turbine itself and then vibration. Problem is I can't get this from this remote region in Palm Springs into the cloud. It's too expensive. Right? So if I was to use today's cell cellular plans, it's ridiculous. It would cost me way too much. So edge computing, I have to move my edge computing out to the location, but I still need to get the results up. So I'm still tackling this problem is how do I get my information from these remote sites? So, so the other interesting uh, thing where there's a ton of movement right now is real-time asset tracking for supply chain. So you can actually get now GPS trackers with cellular connectivity with temperature sensor, humidity, barometric pressure, and light, and an accelerometer with a gyroscope for a bomb cost of about $50. So it's that the bomb is bill, uh, bill of manufacturing for when you go make these things. So for 50 bucks, I can put this little puck on my pallet and I can track it. What's the annual cost? Huh? What's the annual cost? The, well, it's $50 to produce it. Not per year. Per, well, uh, you mean to track it? In, in the dollars, and we'll get into that. So, so, so the thing is I have this puck, and depending upon which solution you're looking at, I can throw it in all my pa packages and I can track it. But how do I track it from Singapore to Germany to Kansas City, right? So, so these are kind of the problems that, you're fa that we're facing tomorrow, which is actually today, right? So wired problems, you know, they're, they've been around, they're kind of easy to solve. Wireless problems are a little bit more problematic. And there's been a lot of players who have been trying to tackle this. Um, so, um, so, you know, here's a great example. So Dong is, a com uh, is one of our customers. They have uh, wind farms out in the middle of the um, uh, English Channel. It takes them a day to dispatch a boat to go out and fix them. Plus, you have to climb 300 feet to deal with it. So they want to get as much predictive anomaly detection as possible so that they can, like, do a better job at maintaining and managing their, their, their wind farms. So, this is where we get to um, our t discussion in low power wide area networks and cellular IoT. And I'm actually going to focus more on the cellular IoT side of things. Um, but for anybody who's still not familiar with low power wide area networks, so they're really ideally suited for uh, fixed assets. Um, the problem with low pan or uh, uh, LPW uh, WAN is that they, it also operates in the um, unlicensed spectrum. So you're limited to about 900 megahertz to 2.4 gigahertz. That's a really crowded spectrum. So it works really well out in the country, but not so well in cities, right? So <laughs> some of the older technologies is Zigbee, six low pan. Some of the newer technologies is LoRa, Sigfox, Weightless. And uh, Helium was actually uh, here yesterday giving a talk. So they, they've been approaching the same problem using the 802.15.4 protocol. So the problem is you've got limited range and you need to have gateways. So I can, I, can, I can mesh together so many nodes, but I have to have a gateway. And that gateway ultimately has to get to the cloud or to the fiber or some, you know, some way it has to route to the internet. So Sigfox is kind of cool. It's a proprietary system that's pretty, uh, pretty dominant through Europe. We'll never, we'll never be here in the United States because uh, our ISPs like Verizon and Sprint won't really allow it. Um, but they have about a 30 mile range, right? So if you're inside their, their, their coverage, awesome. It doesn't matter if I'm moving around or fixed point, but it's pretty much Europe only. So, um, and the key thing is it requires infrastructure and gateways, right? So here's an example of a smart power pole where you would use uh, uh, LoRa 
to create a mesh between the different poles. And then at some point on the pole, you have to have an uplink into the cloud or downlink into fiber. Downlink and fiber works fine if you're in the city, but when that's like accounts for just a small percentage of a utility's power poles coverage. But when I'm out in the middle of nowhere in Texas, you know, 300 miles from a city, I don't have, you know, I don't have fiber. I more than likely might have cellular, right? So, so, so there's still problematics. And this whole notion of doing, you know, broadband over power lines, it's, it just doesn't work. So, um, so we talked about fixed assets. Fixed assets are a little bit easier to, to kind of deal with. But what if my asset's moving, right? Or in a region without infrastructure, right? And requires a long battery life. So what do I do? Well, the answer is cellular IoT. So the problem with this answer, though, is it's all, uh, uh, there's a, a group called the, the 3GPP. And they kind of dictate you know, the 2G, 3G, LTE kind of protocols and specifications. This is all based on LTE. So there's a caveat on what I'm trying to say here is, is that this technology, even though it's focused on machine to machine and low bandwidth in sensors out in the wild, it's still dependent upon the rollout of LTE. So, so what does that mean? So, so we have a global market. And right now, um, as of 2016, this comes from a 2017 report, but as of 2016, there's only a 65% of the population has um, mobile subscriptions. Um, does that mean I have 10 minutes to go? Oh. Um, so you can see the global market is not big. You add to this the penetration of the different types of technologies. So global, you'll see that 2G is still significant, even though they're trying to sunset 2G. You know, it's, it's, it, has a, it, you know it has still a significant uh, percentage of the pie globally in 3G, but when you start to look at places like the sub-Saharan um, Africa, you'll see that it's still predominantly 2G and 3G. All right, so 4G LTEs are gonna be uh, slow to roll out. So what are my applications by category for using these radio technologies? So I have um, CAT4, CAT1, CAT-M1. There's actually CAT0 and CAT-M0, and then this NB-IoT, right? So this kind of shows you where, it's probably hard to read from back there, but where my sensors, wearables, smart devices, and data devices fall based upon their power consumption requirements and the amount of data that they're gonna be transmitting. So for example, if I'm just doing an HVAC control system, I can use NB-IoT, right, about one kilobit per second, right? If I need something that's more than 100, bit, 100 kilobits per second, I'm gonna be looking at a CAT M1, right? So the excitement here, and I'm gonna kinda of go as fast as I can because I've only got a few more minutes. So it shows fundamentally what happens is that the, when, when any cellular radio or modem needs to send out information that's going to use an IP protocol, it has to consume about 850 milliwatts of power. This is required to basically achieve connectivity to three towers, right? So, so in order for me to step up my, my output, radio output, uh, and there's different states of output, the final state in which I can connect to a tower and establish a stable IP session requires a lot of battery power. This is why your phone burns hot. This is why anything that uses cellular connectivity burns hot. This is why the current response to cellular was these low, low power wide area networks. But with these new specifications, you can see that they've set it so that I don't need as much power and I don't need to be talking to as many towers. So, so what happens now is it allows me to start using cellular technologies in different types of, of, of uh, situations. Right, so if I'm going to be using kiosk, video uh, uh, surveillance, I can do CAT1. If pers personal asset trackers, I can do CAT M1. NBIOT, so this one is interesting. It's only for fixed assets. So NBIOT is the one that's going to compete mostly with, uh, with LP WANs, so like LoRa, and it's kind of designed this way. But it has some se severe limitations. A, it's not LTE. Second is that it's, uh, it doesn't handle handoffs between towers. So it's a one tower, half duplex, uh, and it requires minimal power. It's about 10% the cost, but 
it, it doesn't handle, it can't move, right? So it can't go from tower A to tower B. There's no handoff on that. So, so, so it's an interesting trade-off, but it's also going to be cheap, right? So <laughs> here's the difference between uh, LTE CAT M1 and NBU IoT. So the key thing is that these are on the license spectrum, so you get a, a, some security involved. Now, one caveat to anything that's cellular is that they can be jammed. So, so if you're using high value asset tracking, you're gonna have to add something else other than cellular because if it's you know, $500,000 piece of good that's being trans transferred, then I can jam the cell signal and I can steal, steal the asset. Um, <coughs> so, so the key thing is, is that the both modems use the least amount of power and sleep mode. Um, and NB, uh, so uh, NB1 is NBIoT, is expected to cost about 10% of today's LTE CAT 1M modems. So, so, so this is kind of exciting because what it does is, um, so here's CAT M0, this is coming next. Um, it's actually really focused on being able to get 10 year battery lives on two AA uh, um, batteries. Um, so, so this is going to really change this, the, the way IoT is deployed and how people are gonna build IoT solutions. Because if I can get 10 years and two battery power, and I can get cellular connectivity, it, it opens the doors to so much. So um, I'm gonna blitz this real quick. Considerations when deploying real world, battery, battery, battery um, is a big one. Um, but here's the key thing. How do I do it today? All this stuff is happening in a few years. Right? How do I do a real-time asset tracking system that's going to work today? So you're not going to believe the answer, but it's SMS. <laughs> so SMS, I get 200, uh, 200 countries. Um, you have third-party providers like Eris. You can get a SIM card. It costs you a dollar a month. It costs you, you can get it down to one cent per message, and you get 140 bytes per message that you can pack in if you use PDU mode. And then, just kind of wrap it up on, uh, I was really impressed with the talk yesterday uh, with Helium, and if they actually do solve this and get crowdsourced gateways for, and make a public low-powered wire area network, that will also be a game changer. The big question is, will they be able to get the adoption? If they can, it'll be pretty amazing. So, thank you. So. So, so security. So you still need. So you still need to be encrypting packets, right? So, so, so um, it's still cellular technology. I can still listen. I can still listen from the broadcast of the radio to the tower, right? So if you're if you're using like t tip, like uh, fleet telematic systems of yesteryear and a, and still of today, they use UDP, and this is r ridiculous because I can spoof a truck. Well, if this truck is carrying a high value asset. I can spoof it and, mirror, and make it ghosted all over the place and then go attack the asset itself where it really is. So, so you still need encryption, right? So, so even though I'm on a license spectrum and I have a lot of the benefits from that, you don't want to be transmitting data in the clear. So. Uh, not directly, no. We've been focusing on this. Satellite's very expensive, right? It's, it's uh, it's it's not it's a non-trivial and very expensive and the power can. Oh, of course, of course, the coverage is better. Yeah, but 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 today, you know, I can do so. The thing about this SMS solution, I can do that for. Um, oops. So the SMS solution, I can do this for. Uh, I can send. Uh, I can track like eight pallets for a few dollars, a like a couple of dollars a day. I can't do that on, on cellular, right? I mean, entire shipment of, with eight devices, I can track for a couple of dollars a day. So, so, so that's the key is that when it rolls into place, it'll be significant. Satellite, I think, is going to suffer once some of these technologies become more adopted. So, but satellite will always be there. I don't think it's gonna go away, so. Well, what's the initial market for $8,000 for a lifetime of sensor effect? I'm sorry? 
two dollars a day is about eight thousand for a lifetime on the project. So what can be expected margins when we pay eight thousand dollars for so, so right now real time asset tracking systems go for three hundred and fifty dollars per shipment. So yeah, there's, if you go out and you look in, real, in, in logistics with third-party logistics and freight forwarders, you'll go out and you'll see that what, what the current rate for these companies, there's Cargo Signal, um, I forget, there's a few other ones, they charge about 350 per shipment. Sure, but you'd have to ask yourself, what's the battery? So, so. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, as these things get down, because right now you look at, if you go into the real-time logistics and supply chain tracking, they all use lithium-ion batteries, and they only have like a four or five day life. So, so and that's because it's using cellular, it's using, they sometimes have cellu a mixed mode, cellular and satellite, and then they're using it, they're burning a GPS all the time. And so it's like, all right, I got four days. Can you imagine sensors now that get 10 year battery life? You know, it's going to be significant. Yes. So, uh, apologies if you didn't hear you today, but do they mostly care about tracking these assets for loss, or is it just for scheduling and arranging for meetup with and moving things as possible? So, so for, for utilities, I want to know the health of my asset, like my power poles, right? That's one use case. The other one is I want to be able to get telemetry off of my assets. That's another use case. And then for shipping and logistics, is I want to basically know where my asset is and what condition it is in, right? So that's, that's where IoT really becomes legitimate, right? This is where it, it's actually something more than a bunch of people pontificating about, you know, connecting things, <laughs> so. so. I have a question. Uh, what is sort of the, the uh, developer Well, again, it depends on your, 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 what you're trying to solve. So if I'm, if I'm, if I'm uh, tracking something and I'm only interested in where it's at, uh, reporting once a day is fine. But let's say, for example, I'm, I'm doing a cold chain, right, and I need to do produce or chemicals for farm, big pharma. I want to know instantly or very quickly when the temperature is changing, right, because it, it then suddenly goes into all these FDA compliance for track and trace. You know, I have all these problems. So it really depends. But from your question was actually from a developer standpoint. Um, let's see if I can answer this properly. So this stuff is actually really easy to prototype. Like, so your grist board is a good example of, of a board that's available today that I can start doing stuff. It's driving, you know, has Erlang on the hardware, which is pretty amazing. But you can also get Beagle Bones, right? These things are $35 boards, Raspberry Pi. Uh, if you go to DigiKey, um, or you just Google, I should have put a link up here, I'll, I'll like, tell you. But there are IoT projects that you can build with cellular modems that you know you spend 100 bucks and you can actually build this yourself. So in terms of development, the barrier is like incredibly low, it's ridiculous. Like I can go and spend a few hundred dollars, prototype an idea for a company, and then decide whether or not there's any business value without, you know, just for a few hundred dollars. You can do that today.